Um, light obviously is an important building block for photosynthesis, and we're detailing this section as daily light integral or DLI. And there's been a lot of work on light. Obviously, plants have to have it. And DLI is really the accumulation of that light that plants are receiving over time. And so we're going to talk about how photosynthesis driver uh, produces carbohydrates, which are the building blocks and food for our plants. But also uh, a really big field right now is light quality and then photomorpho photomorphogenesis, which is really how we control the growth, the structure, the shape, the habit of plants using different colors of light in a sense. There we go. So uh, what are we seeing in this first picture here? Now, we saw it in the beginning, but we didn't really detail a lot of that randomness that we're seeing. And hydration is really just a part of that story. Obviously, it's a very important part, but what we see on the stock plant level is, as Will said, overnight, cuttings and plants become very well hydrated. So in the morning, when cuttings are harvested, that cutting is going to be very turgid. But as we go throughout the day, those plants are accumulating light or DLI. And this, as we said, produces carbohydrates or food for the plant. So depending on when we harvest different species of plants, they may be more hydrated or have more carbohydrates. And it's not always the same of whether some plants um, always like to be harvested in the morning or be harvested in the afternoon. In this case, we looked at budlia or butterfly bush. And when we harvested those cuttings in the morning, we had this randomness, even though we had already addressed that rehydration issue, everything was all hydrated. We still got this random root growth. Some rooted very well, some did not. Now, when we harvested those cuttings in the afternoon, again, these cuttings were hydrated, we get a very uniform rooting and speedy rooting of those cuttings. So um, carbohydrates here are very important because we've loaded up those cuttings prior to their harvesting point. We've addressed the rehydration, so they have all of the food um, that's needed. So now let's look at the science behind this photo. Uh, now, Druge has done a lot of work with post-harvest handling, cuttings, and also root development. And let's dive into some of those carbohydrates, which is also what I worked on with my PhD uh, in cut flowers. So glucose, fructose, and sucrose, we know, are common um, carbohydrates that are easily transported or broken down or used within the plant. Now, starch is something that you may not often be talking about, but we all love them, right? They're in potatoes. They're also in other plant materials or organs. And those that starch is the storage area for energy. And so we have to look at all four of these within plants. On the left-hand side, we have the concentration of these carbohydrates, either in the leaves on the top or on the bottom in that stem base of the cuttings. Now, when we look at the leaves, you often think about, well, this is where I see nutrient deficiencies in rooting, but this is also the uh, source of the carbohydrates for the cutting once they're stuck. So all of the photosynthesis is occurring in the leaves, and that's going to go downwards towards the sink at the base of the cutting over time. Now, these cuttings have to be shipped for multiple days from likely offshore locations, and so they're going to have a period of time where they're going to be dark, they're going to be boxed, as Will said, we want to pre-cool them. But in that dark period of time, we're not photosynthesizing, so we are potentially using up those carbohydrates during this time. So in the leaf, up on this top graph, we have glucose, fructose, and sucrose, and then in green is starch. Now, over time, looking at the DPE, or days post-excision, so that's after harvest, as we increase those days, we really start to see a decrease in the amount of starch. Just after one day, we've basically eliminated all the starch from these leaves. And then if you go down and look at the stem base, we're also decreasing that starch or storage reserves. But that's not really happening uh, again until one to three days after um, harvest. 
Now the glucose, fructose, and sucrose are also getting used up in some capacity, uh, but those are more mobile and starch can break down into those components. So when we think about storage or shipping, we really want to load up our cuttings and have high starch content because that is the storage or reserves for our cuttings. So now we're getting to the rooting process. And once we've got the cuttings, we've stuck the cuttings, uh, we've made sure that all our stock plants have the right amount of light and they have as much carbohydrate as possible once they get to the customer. Uh, now it's the customer's job or the rooting station's job to provide the right quantity or amount of light within the day to produce rooting as fast as possible and uniformly. So again, we're driving carbohydrate production by increasing the amount of light within a day that a cutting gets. Uh, Michigan State, as well as Purdue, has done a number of research projects on this. And as you can see on the right-hand side, when we increase the amount of light that cuttings are getting within a day, say from 1.3 all the way to uh, 10.8, we really get a lot more root production. And why? Well, we're producing more carbohydrates in our leaves, which are then getting transported down to the stem base to then increase rooting. However, you can't just jump the gun and give all the gas right away, right? Your tires are gonna spin. You're not gonna get enough traction to get these cuttings off. You're gonna cause some damage to them. So we have to think about this acclimation process. Uh, in that first figure you saw that Will went over is the light increases over the life of the cutting into producing a rooted liner. So uh, plants do have a limitation to how much light they can use right away, and that is a saturation point, which really causes damage in the photosynthesis process or the system. And so right when we stick cuttings, you may want to look at, can I shade these cuttings, or what is the actual light intensity or PPFD within your greenhouse? and limit that and then increase it over time as that plant becomes more adjusted to its environment. As it grows more roots, it can then to use more light and produce more carbohydrates. How much light do you really need to provide though? Um, uh, Jim Faust at Clemson has really developed a lot of great DLI maps for uh, the United States. You can access that website down here on the bottom of the slide. But really when we're looking for high quality young plants or liners from vegetative cuttings, we're targeting a DLI of about six moles or more. Um, so you can look at and use this map uh, to determine what month you're in, how much light you're getting, and you'll wanna reduce these numbers from about 25 to 50%, depending on your greenhouse structure and how much light you're getting into the greenhouse, and then put lighting in there and supplement to make sure you're at least getting six moles per day for uh, unrooted cutting production or for vegetative liner production. I also put in here increasing your intensity over time. Again, this is PPFD or micromoles per meter squared per second. Uh, get yourself a light meter. It's gonna be a great investment for your operation and knowing how much light is coming in there and how to manage that light. And then again, light is not a factor on its own. It's interacting with temperature and nutrition. We've already talked about hydration and making sure we're set there. But as we increase light, we need to make sure that we're at the right temperature as well as providing the resources for the plants to produce those carbohydrates with the amount of light we're providing. This gets us into the probably the most exciting part about light and you'll see a lot of work going on in LEDs right now, even in the home sector, right? Uh, we're trend, we're out of incandescence, and now we're getting to LED lights everywhere. Uh, this has a lot to do with energy efficiency, but there are these factors or X factors that we can use lights for um, controlling photomorphogenesis. And again, that's controlling height, controlling leaf structure, um, branching, all of these components that really set plant quality apart from the next person. So here I've got pictured a bunch of different uh, spectrums or wavelengths of light that uh, we can look at. On the left-hand side, this is ambient light or natural sunlight that uh, in a greenhouse, say in Illinois, you're not providing any extra light. 
this is what your plant's receiving over time. And generally we're looking at around 400 to 700 nanometers, um, which is anywhere from that blue or dark purple spectrum all the way into the red spectrum or color. And when we produce plants under this ambient or natural sunlight with a low amount of DLI, so again, that's not very much light that they're accumulating in a day, we tend to get a stretchy plant that's still rooted, but it's not the best thing we really want for someone we're selling these liners to. All the way on the right-hand side is the high pressure sodium lamp. Now this is the tried and true light that's been used for quite a while within the greenhouse industry. And as you can see that the, the spectrum is quite different from natural light. We've got a lot of red, a lot of yellow, a little bit of blue, a little bit of green, and then there's that far red black bump all the way on the right hand side. And with this, we can produce a higher quality plant that's slightly shorter, more well branched, and is actually flowering in comparison to the ambient light. And that's because we've supplemented the amount of light. Then we have in the middle, and these are plants produced under uh, light emitting diode fixtures or LEDs. And I've got the uh, DRWLB, and that stands for a deep red, white, low blue fixture, or MB, which is a medium blue fixture. And there you can see that these lights are very specific in their wavelength. We've got a section of blue, we've got a section of green, lots of red, and a little bit of uh, dark here in the bottom. And really what this is saying is that we've targeted that low blue, which you can see is higher in the medium blue. We've got green to make it look more white. And then that deep red is here, which is the biggest portion and uh, very well used for photosynthesis within the plant. Now, what I want you to see through this picture are these dotted lines and really looking at the difference in the height of these liners. And so with the LEDs, we're able to produce a slightly shorter, more compact liner that still has the same number of leaves, but this really reduces uh, what we're going to talk about in the next slide is the potential um, use of plant growth regulators to keep plants more compact. So as this video shows up, you'll see this floppy plug on the left-hand side and a very well um, compact, shorter leaves, um, more green plant on the right-hand side. And it was flopping around on the left-hand one. And so really what our growers want to produce at the end of the day is a liner that's um, more compact and resilient to shipping, uh, to transplanting for automation in the future, um, and something that looks really aesthetically pleasing and healthy to the customer going out the door. So with this uh, photomorphogenesis control with different spectrums, we really have the ability to move to a more sustainable production system, which is a key component of Ball, the co our company moving forward, as well as lots of other industries how do we produce our products more sustainably? And one way is to reduce the number of chemicals we're putting out into the environment. So with these lights, you'll see on the right-hand side are these different petioles of petunia. Now these top two were produced under high pressure sodium uh, with or without PGRs. And then these bottom four were produced with LEDs with or without PGR. And of course, in the top, you see this really large um, paler green leaf from the petunia. And then when you use PGRs, you do get a little bit uh, shorter leaf, right? Great. Um, but it's not quite what we're looking for because we're still getting that floppy plug here we saw in the video. With LEDs, we've basically reduced the length of that leaf by in half, as well as you can see a darker color. Um, so when you add PGRs under the yellow, we do still get a little bit reduction. So there's an option there for growers to use, but really this is showing us that we have the opportunity to produce these plants without plant growth regulators. Basically we're eliminating a chemical application. So we're saving labor. Uh, we're improving our environment for our workers as well as uh, nature. Oh, 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 oh,